in my own field of sociology, we have a very strong belief that there are certain things about your family of origin that have a, a deep permanent fixture on your, your possibilities. And, and also looking at the formative role of, of education and of um, youth experiences. What we found, however, is that there is absolutely no statistically significant relationship between what you do before age 20 and your likelihood of assuming a very senior leadership position later on in life. It doesn't matter where you went to school. It does not matter what grades you made. It does not matter if you were in um, uh, uh, extracurricular activities. It does not matter if your family was wealthy or poor. It does not matter um, in what city you were born. None of those things matter. At the same time, there are certain things that happen uniquely in Christian institutions of education that make a profound difference in your likelihood to succeed. Principally, it's about having a formative relationship with a mentor. And um, what, what we found is that a lot of you know, schools and uh, businesses try to create structured mentoring programs, a management trainee program where you take 20 new people and you match them up with a senior executive. Or, um, you know, in my church youth group, we had basically a system where adult volunteers agreed to mentor in a Bible study fellowship format with young people who wanted that. And those are all well and good, but actually those don't work very effectively. The real way in which mentoring works effectively is through organic relationships. Christian organizations, the, the most important thing that they can do is they create the ecosystem and create the opportunity out of which those relationships can develop. And unlike uh, state-run institutions of learning or uh, public schools in this country, which have a pretty bureaucratic approach to relationships, um, Christian institutions recognize we're really about transforming the individual. Right? That we're, we're in this work not because we're trying to pass in, pass down a certain body of knowledge, but we're really invested in, in this young person. I care deeply about this particular student. And so I'm willing to do whatever it, can, whatever it takes to try and help them. If it means helping them get a job, if it means helping them um, uh, navigate a, a family issue, if it means helping them learn a subject. And so it really doesn't matter. A lot of your major demographic characteristics do not matter on your likelihood to succeed. What does matter is the formative influence of an adult who speaks into your life and then who has a sustaining relationship with you that you carry with you. Each of us could identify one, two, three people outside of our family who had a formative influence. And my hunch is that it's a relationship you had not for months or for semesters, but for years. That's what Christian institutions can create. And that's one of the things that we found that was really surprising. So even, it's intriguing that um, even though you're emphasizing a kind of investment in an individual and a mentoring one-on-one -on -one often even relationship, you're saying there's sort of institutional encouragements that can make that happen. Yes. So it's not anti-institutional to imagine it in that way. Oh, I'm, de I'm a big yeah, believer yeah. in institutions. Yeah. So I, so I've, I think institutions play a very formative role. What I don't think works are the, the structured mentoring programs where, you know, as president of Gordon College, I go in and say, look, we need to have a mentoring program, so we're going to get 200 of our best students and we're going to match them up. That almost never works. I mean, you tick off a box and say you have a mentoring program, but actually the relationship investment you're trying to do, that doesn't work. What institutions can do, however, is introduce people and then create simulate experiences where relationships will flourish. So wilderness experiences, taking people on trips, these are the things that you do where people bond. And so you're looking for opportunities where those bonding experiences can occur. So one of the things that I have to think about a lot as a college president is that we spend a, we spend a decent amount of our institutional resources thinking about the formal curriculum of Gordon College when in fact the hidden curriculum of Gordon College has a much deeper influence. Every institution of uh, learning has a hidden curriculum. I think Christian institutions are more mindful of that and more strategic about deploying it, but everybody has a hidden curriculum. 
what we have to do is create the environment where those relationships can last for a long time. So I was, I, it's funny, I was, was sort of rocked back on my heels uh, when I hit this line, and you've already broached it. Counter to what many people think, it doesn't really matter what future leaders do before they're 20. Yep. In view from the top, you talk about what you call platinum leaders, which is this really brilliant acronym that you can explain for folks if you want. I, I just kept thinking of them as, you just said, catalytic yeah. leaders. So they're influential. They sort of change worlds around them, and yeah. they have all these kinds of features. And I, I was fascinated when you said almost all of them take a liberal arts approach to life. Yeah. Can you say more? Because I, I think our audience here would be very interested to know what that means. So one of the key things that, that we've found is if you're, trying to, if you're trying to identify the characteristics of what will make somebody a very, very successful senior leader, one of the easiest ways is to find out how good a conversationalist they are. Because when you rise to senior leadership, it's assumed that you understand your particular field or that you can do whatever it is that your company or your organization does. But you have to be able to build bridges with lots of different people. Most of senior leadership is bridge building. And so you're looking for folks who can get along with lots of different kinds of individuals. A liberal arts approach to life says, look, I, I'm not necessarily focused on trying to become a specialist. I'm actually actively trying to become a generalist. Because senior leadership at really high levels is fundamentally about generalities. There is a reason why the U.S. military refers to their top officers as generals. It is because you have to have that wide perspective. And so um, in the book we talk about most of um, corporate life, in particular in the U.S., rewards specialization. And so you promote somebody because they're actually good in their given field. The problem is that the more you promote them, the wider their perspective has to be and the less prepared they are for those kinds of experiences. So our job in educating young people is to, is to give them the, um, the lenses by which they can understand the wideness of their responsibilities that they will not have when they're 25. You never, as a 25-year-old, have a very wide-ranging job. That doesn't happen unless you create an organization yourself. Instead, you go to work you know, in a junior level position at a particular company and you do one little thing. But as you move up, you have to have that wide perspective. The problem is that most of professional development that happens in jobs doesn't prepare people for that wide experience. So if they don't get that liberal arts approach to life early on, they don't cultivate it. So it's really important that our young people read widely and we need to reward them to do that. Incentives really help. I mean, people ask me, why do we require chapel credit at Gordon College? It's because I know that I have to instill within students a, a desire to go and hear different kinds of people than they normally would. I want them to be exposed to a wide range of things. Um, this summer, we're putting in some televisions in the Student Center. And we haven't had that there before. And they were talking about what stations are we going to have uh, direct feeds. It's really important to me that we have something other than CNN or Fox News. I want BBC or somebody else to add sort of different perspective. I, I'm, I'm delighted you read The Economist. Not enough people do. And I really want folks to have sort of a broader range perspective. So that liberal arts approach to life we found makes a real difference. So I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, and my mom uh, is retiring this year after serving as head of school of Jackson Preparatory School. Uh, it's an independent day school, um, grades 6 to 12, has about 800 students there. And um, if you had to ask me where the cultural center of power in the United States is, it probably is not Jackson, Mississippi. So I have these conversations with my mom who says, you know, we feel a real responsibility to helping to develop young people, and we feel far away from the corridors of power that you write about. And she says, I'm not even sure I want to get them in those corridors of power, but if we did, I don't think that we have the on-ramp or the, the mechanisms where that can occur. What do I do? Well, one of the key things that, that um, a key insights that I think we in the church sometimes forget, there has developed in the last 10 years a debate about how culture changes. And it's been boiled down to two approaches. It's top-down, elites who are in power, and they impose their view on society, and that's how power works. Or it's a bottom-up approach, sort of grassroots movement. I'm very persuaded by a political philosopher named J.P. Nettle. 
who likens social movements and their effectiveness to rock formations. And he says there's two kind of rock formations. If you go into a cave, you have stalactite rock formations, which come down from the top. That's the T. Stalactite come down from the top. Or stalagmite, which come up from the ground. And he says if you're wanting to figure out what's the strongest base of support, it's when the stalactite formation meets up with a stalagmite rock formation, and they form a single column. That, in my opinion, is very important and quite instructive for us to think about all kinds of social movements. So the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s, how did it become so effective? Why did it become so widespread? It's because the stalagmite movement, which started in the 1950s through the black church in the U.S., began to get institutional sanction from basically white elites in Washington. It's one of the few times when the U.S. government and the U.S. Congress was actually ahead of the general public in enforcing a particular social policy. Most of politics is the rear guard, endorsing what the culture says. This was one time where actually the political landscape was ahead of them. What they did that was so effective is that you have the Attorney General and the U.S. Congress from the top endorsing a social movement that began in the black church. What we have to do in Christian education is we have to create on-ramps where our young people can indeed be exposed to people who come in from the top. So we do that through guest speakers. We do that by taking them on field trips to cultural institutions. We do that by helping them to get opportunities that do expose them. So we don't create an insular, um, separate ecosystem. I have no desire to build an evangelical subculture. None. I lead an evangelical institution. I believe very deeply in it. But my vision is for Gordon to be at the vanguard of conversations that are happening in Boston, which just happens to be the global capital for higher education. And oftentimes, I'm just lucky to get a seat at the table in Boston because I'm competing with lots more powerful institutions. But I do believe that by getting a seat at that table, we can be part of very important conversations. So networks do really matter. At the same time, too much of the evangelical movement of the last 50 years has been so focused on getting a seat at the table that they've lost their distinctive witness of what it is that we actually bring to the table. And so it's just about getting access. It's not about getting real influence. What we have to do is recognize all cultural movements begin on the margins of society. And in Canada and in the U.S., evangelicalism is a marginal movement. It's not the cultural center. We are the place of innovation. That's where new ideas emerge. Now, it doesn't become institutionalized until the center of the culture embraces it. So what we have to do as educational leaders is create the linkages between those two arenas. That, in my opinion, is how we actually have wider influence. So the, um, th there's no reason why, say, Christian education needs to be provincial or insulated. Uh, we can look for ways to have it the intersection without, but I, I appreciate this sense of not losing, um, well, holiness maybe would be a yeah. fair way to talk yeah, about it. I mean, right. th in other words, you can, you can so prize um, a place at the table, yeah. which you might prize for reasons of influence, but you don't realize that the influence ends up going the other way Precisely. and assimilation ends up being the result instead. That's right. So what we have done is we convinced ourselves that we as individuals can, can overcome the institutional inertia that might be pushing against us. So we say, I just want to get a seat at the table, but once I get a seat at the table, then I'll be able to, to have the influence. Actually, it doesn't work that way. The institutions are always more powerful than the individual. Always. And so that's why it's so fundamental, for example, it's so fundamental for students at Gordon College to be deeply connected to the life of a local church. Because we recognize that the church is going to provide them with a set of, of um, tools and a way of seeing the world that will allow them, that will ground them in a way that once they get the seat at the table, they, they won't be overcome by sort of the, the wider secularizing, modernizing forces. Too many very well-meaning evangelical leaders have thought that they will be the agent of influence when they get a seat at the table and they underestimate how likely it is that they are to be the ones influence themselves.